Since we're in the middle of spooky season, it felt like the perfect time to talk about the creators of horror punk, The Misfit. I can't remember if someone recommended I do this video, but if you end up really enjoying this style of video, just kind of looking at the story behind bands, and you want to see one on your favorite band, leave a comment below. I keep a running list of bands that my viewers recommend I do a video on, so hopefully someday I'll get to it, and then you can have a little bit more of the history behind your favorite band. Also, if you like this video, consider sharing it with a friend, subscribe if you want to see more of it, and please like the video, it really helps with the algorithm. Glenn Anzalone had a pretty interesting start to his life. He was the third of four sons born to a TV repairman and Marine veteran, and his mom was a record store employee. Like a lot of kids who grew up in the suburbs in the 60s, Glenn had a deep love for horror movies, mostly of the B-rate variety, and comic books. Growing up in Lodi, New Jersey, he was a bit of an outsider. He said that while other kids were reading, quote, stupid stuff, he was reading things like Edgar Allan Poe. When he was pretty young, Glenn started to develop a deep love of heavy metal music, but also alcohol and drugs. By the age of 10, he started to abuse alcohol and drugs, which led him into a little bit of trouble with the police, but by the age of 15, he was completely sober. As a kid, he started taking clarinet lessons and then eventually taught himself how to play the guitar, which led to him being a little bit involved in the local music scene that was happening in New Jersey. He was an untrained vocalist, but he started to sing in bands like Tallis and Koo Dot and Boo Jang, which he said was mostly just like Black Sabbath covers and other heavy metal band covers. Even though he was a completely self-taught singer, he wasn't that bad, and his vocal ability got the attention of quite a few of the local artists in the Lodi, New Jersey scene. But Glenn's first love was always comic books. When he graduated high school, he ended up going to the NYU Tisch School of the Arts to kind of study how to create comic books. Maybe it was kind of being in and around New York as a young man in the mid-70s, or maybe it was, as he says, his just deep anger at everything but Glenn started to really fall in love with that underground punk scene that was happening in New York around CBGB in Max's Kansas City. So Glenn decided to create his own project that would kind of showcase his influences and his art. He decided to create a band that would play strictly original music, unlike his other bands that he was in before it. So in 1976, Misfits was born, and he named it after Marilyn Monroe's last film that she was in. Glenn knew he needed other people than just him and this band, so he started looking around for other musicians. He first found Manny Martinez. Manny was actually a high school friend of his from Lodi, New Jersey, and the two of them started to look around for other people to join the band. They started to just bring in other friends they knew who owned instruments or played instruments and just kind of had like haphazard rehearsals for a bit. Nothing really regimented or serious at all until about February of 1977 when things started to ramp up a notch. Manny happened to see a neighbor of his taking a bass out of his car and kind of understandably Manny thought that meant the kid played bass. So Manny asked him if he wanted to join the band and the kid said yes. But Jerry Only, who had only gotten the bass a few months earlier as a late Christmas present, had never actually played it before and didn't know what he was doing. But when Jerry joined the band, the trio of Glenn, Manny, and Jerry started to rehearse more seriously and actually try and form a project out of this loose group of musicians. Jerry was born Gerald Kayafe Jr. in Lodi, New Jersey in 1959. His family was pretty working class. His dad worked in a factory and his mother was a librarian. Jerry was the middle child of two brothers. When Jerry joined the band, the trio started to rehearse some songs that Glenn had actually written himself. And because they were written by Glenn, they kind of showcased his interests, which was horror movies and comic books and that kind of like supernatural stuff. For those first three months, they didn't have a guitarist. They just had Glenn up front with his electric keyboard, but they still managed to get their first gig at CBGB in April of 1977. If you want to learn more about CBGB, which is kind of called the mecca of punk music, I have a whole video on it, so check that out if you want to kind of learn more about that scene. I think pretty quickly Glenn realized that what Misfits was doing didn't really fit with the whole CBGB scene, but there really wasn't anywhere else for them to play at that time. In August of 1977, they released their first single, which was called Cough Cold, 
and they released it on a label that they created themselves called Blank Records. And that kind of became a common thing in punk music, especially the more hardcore variety, with bands like Minor Threat and Black Flag both creating labels to self-release their own music. But back at the time that Glenn started Blank Records, that really wasn't much of a thing. When that single was released, Jerry's last name was misspelled on the packaging, which led him to say that from then on, he wanted to be credited as only Jerry. Jerry only. So, after that, he was forever known as Jerry only. And he also graduated high school around that same time. That Cough Cold single didn't really sound like the misfits that people would grow to know and love really didn't have any of the horror theatrics. It was more just like a standard heavy metal sound. Right after they released that single, Frank Licata joined the band as a guitarist, and that let Glenn focus mostly just on singing and being the front man, and he no longer had to play his keyboard. Frank went by the stage name Franche Coma. A few things started happening at once towards the end of 1977. Mercury Records, who didn't know that Glenn had already created and released something through a label called Blank Records, because why would they know that, also released an album through a subsidiary label that they created and called Blank Records. So in order to just own the naming rights to Blank Records and not have to deal with all of that, they bought it from Glenn and for payment they gave him 30 hours of studio time. And Mercury also had the option to release their first record after that studio time. Glenn happily accepted that offer. He wanted the professional studio time. I mean, what indie band wouldn't? But also around that same time, Glenn and Jerry started to think that Manny was a little bit too unreliable for a more serious band. Manny lived across town and he would often miss rehearsals. So they kicked Manny out of the band and Glenn called up an old friend of his named Mr. Jim to fill in on drums. So, Glenn, Jerry, Franche, and Mr. Jim entered the studio to record their first album. Jim Catania had known Glenn for quite a long time. They were old classmates, and they had been in a, at least one band together. So it was a pretty easy fit to invite him into the band. The band ended up recording 17 songs, and Mercury didn't want it, and they really struggled to find any label interested in putting out this music. So Glenn decided to just release them himself as, like, singles and EPs, through a new record label he started called Plan 9, which was taken from the horror movie Plan 9 from Outer Space. After this first time in the studio was when the Misfits really started to take shape as the band that we know today. Glenn started to write more songs around horror movies and the supernatural, and he started to paint skeletons on his clothing. Jerry only face. <laughs> Jerry started to wear his hair in like one long braid down the front of his face that the other band members would also start copying, and it was called the Devil Lock. For most of the early days, while they were trying to get the band off the ground and get their name out there and build an audience, they were supported by Jerry working at the machine shop where his father worked. Glenn fully embraced the whole do-it-yourself attitude of punk music and had designed most of the artwork for the packaging himself. In order to support the singles and EPs they were putting out, the band really focused on playing more frequently and touring, which... Franche didn't really like. He didn't like the harder touring schedule, so he ended up quitting the band after a show in Detroit. The band drove him home to New Jersey from Detroit and then drove back to continue the tour. After the tour, Mr. Jim also quit the band because he didn't really like the new horror style that they were moving into. Mr. Jim played kind of a more standard punk style, very fast, very feverish, and he felt that that style didn't really fit in with where misfits were headed they definitely were moving beyond just standard punk and just wasn't really a musical fit for him so he decided to back out franche went on to form another band called active ingredients and mr jim ended up mostly focusing on the other band he was in at that time called continental crawler mr jim would also eventually move on to play for other punk bands like the adults and aces and eights he's still around playing in other punk bands in mostly like smaller markets. By December of 1978, those two guys had been replaced and they were a full band again. They brought in Joey Poole, who went by Joey Image, to play drums. He was another guy from New Jersey, but he had spent most of his life living in Manhattan. 
Glenn and Jerry actually saw him practicing in a studio in the city and asked him if he wanted to join the band. And on guitar, they brought in Bobby Coffold, who was known as Bobby Steele. Bobby grew up in New Jersey, but moved to Manhattan in 1978, and he played for several other punk bands before joining the Misfits. He had placed an ad in a magazine, which Glenn responded to, and he got an audition and made it into the band. They released a single through Planet Nine called Horror Business in 1978, and it featured this kind of like skeletal figure on the cover. That song is said to be inspired by Nancy Spungen's death. She was the girlfriend of Sid Vicious, who died from a stab wound. A lot of people think Sid was the one who killed her, though that was never actually proven. Sid would die of an overdose a few days after getting out on bail for that murder. I have a whole video on the Sex Pistols if you want to watch that. It'll be linked in the description below. But it was rumored that Sid was going to launch kind of a solo career, and he had picked the Misfits to be his backing band when he did that. So there was always that kind of like Sid Vicious Misfits connection. So people think horror business was written about Nancy's death. The figure on the cover, the kind of like skeletal figure, was inspired by the Crimson Ghost, who was from this old like film serial in the 40s. The Crimson Ghost quickly became the mascot and the main logo for the Misfits and it's one of the most iconic logos in the history of rock. The typical Misfits show at this time would open with a series of horror movie trailers projected on a screen, at the end of which the band would break through the screen and start playing. At one point, the Misfits opened for the iconic British punk band The Damned, and Jerry, after the show, kind of broached the idea of doing a tour with them in the UK, which eventually came to be kind of unfortunately for everyone involved. It turns out when the Misfits got to England, the singer of The Damned didn't think Jerry was all that serious about that conversation and had no plans for the Misfits to join them on tour, which wasn't helped by the fact that Jerry never signed any contracts with that singer or the band's management. So when the iconic British punk legends decided to try and make something work and get Misfits on the bill, the Misfits kind of got frustrated with the rented gear and the lack of pay and they ended up leaving the tour after two shows. After that, Joey Image quit the band. He had been struggling with some substance abuse issues, and he had some frustrations with Jerry and Glenn and some creative differences, so he ended up flying home. He played with many other different punk bands and ended up reprising his role in The Misfits in 2000, but in 2016, he was diagnosed with liver cancer and unfortunately passed away in 2020. Meanwhile, the band was in England with a flight home at the end of the tour that they were no longer on, so they decided to just kind of hang around in England for a bit. Jerry only had actually somehow become friends with Sid Vicious's mom, so she offered to show him around London. So while he was out with Mrs. Vicious, Glenn and Bobby decided to go see a band called The Jam. While they were waiting for The Jam to play, they got into a fight with two skinheads and ended up spending a couple days in jail, which was the inspiration behind the song London Dungeon. With no drummer, the band ended up taking a few months off until they finally were able to replace Joey with a drummer who had never been in a band before named Arthur McGuckin, who went by the name Arthur Googie. At the same time, Jerry's younger brother Paul, who was only 16 at the time, had been a longtime fan of the Misfits. He had loved them basically since Jerry joined, and he was learning how to play guitar, being taught by Jerry Only and Glenn. Paul at that time was also going by the name Doyle, and he would later become Doyle Wolfgang von Frankenstein. Though the band had a little bit of a problem. They already had Bobby Steele on guitar, but they kind of wanted Doyle on, on guitar instead. So when Bobby missed a recording session, Jerry kind of seized the opportunity and fired him from the band, and then he was replaced by Doyle. Jerry said about that whole situation, quote, if Bobby had something to do, then the band came second. We eventually replaced Bobby with Doyle, and the rest is history. Doyle is a phenomenon as far as guitar players go, end quote. But Glenn remembered things just a little bit differently. He said, quote, They wanted Bobby out and Doyle in. I said, look, I don't really care, but don't lead Bobby on anymore. I was teaching Doyle stuff on guitar, and it wasn't working. His hands were just too big. They didn't tell Bobby, so I did. They wanted him to come down to the show and not know he was out, which was not cool. End quote. Bobby, for his part, kind of always suspected that Jerry wanted him out of the band so that he could bring his brother in, and then Jerry would end up having more influence over the direction of the band. Bobby went on to form a band called The Undead, which released its first EP in 1982. 
a project that Glenn actually helped fund and back. Currently, Bobby is still playing with the Undead, and he's the only original member still in the band. In 1982, the band finally released their debut full-length album called Walk Among Us. This album is kind of seen as like the quintessential Misfits style. It is that melodic horror punk that they are known for. The band ended up spending a lot of time in California for this album, and they went on tour to kind of support it. And the shows became a little bit more intense with Arthur and Glenn getting into quite a few fights. During one night, Arthur wanted a little bit of extra money for an extra cheeseburger at McDonald's, which led to this massive blow up with Glenn, which ended in Arthur leaving the band. That whole situation delayed their plans to record and release their next EP. Around this time, Glenn was kind of getting sick of the whole Misfits thing. He told Henry Rollins of Black Flag fame that he was probably going to end up quitting the band. He had already kind of started working on new stuff for a side project. But the band ended up recording some songs for a new project that was supposed to be an EP called Earth AD. Glenn decided to record a couple more songs for that project that he had originally written for this new side project of his. So it kind of turned Earth AD into their second full-length album. And that's an album that Glenn said he doesn't like all that much. It was basically like a hardcore punk album, which... Glenn didn't really like, but was very popular in the underground scene in the early 80s, especially in California where they were living while they recorded it. Glenn said, quote, the songs were played too fast and the album ended up sounding like one long song. That's because the guys in the band couldn't play, end quote. He's later acknowledged that a lot of fans really love that album, but it's just not one that he particularly likes. During their annual Halloween performance in 1983, I believe they were in Detroit, things kind of boiled to a head with the band and Glenn announced that it would be their last show. After that show, they drove back to Lodi, New Jersey and went their separate ways. Doyle and Jerry wouldn't see Glenn for decades after that. Jerry and Doyle moved back in with their family in Vernon, New Jersey and started working with their dad at the machine parts factory where he worked. Jerry became far more focused on his Christian faith and he ended up getting married and having a kid. Almost immediately, Glenn formed a new band called Somhine, which was more just classic metal sound. In 1987, the brothers Jerry and Doyle returned to music with a Christian heavy metal band that they called Christ the Conqueror. That same year, Glenn did a massive shakeup of his band, firing most of the rhythm section and renaming it Danzig. During the time that they were a band, the Misfits never really even came close to breaking into the mainstream. They were pretty well known and well respected in that kind of like underground punk scene that they were a part of, but outside of that, no one knew who they were. But after they broke up and Glenn found success with his new band, that started to change a little bit. A lot of the up-and-coming bands of the 90s that kind of like pop-punk style cited them as major influences, and it kind of turned this whole new generation on to the Misfits. So after they were dead, the band finally started to get a little bit of popularity, which led to Glenn releasing some compilations and some re-releases of their albums, which then led to a court battle for royalties between him and Jerry and Doyle. They ended up settling out of court for that, and part of the settlement was that Jerry and Doyle were allowed to release new music and kind of resurrect the Misfits name, which they've wasted no time doing. This new version of the Misfits, which launched in 1995, was not really well received. Glenn refused to come back as vocalist, and critics just kind of felt that it was different than it used to be. Honestly, I don't really care all that much about this new version of the Misfits, so we're just going to kind of like skim over it. Jerry was basically the primary driving factor of this band the whole time, and they leaned really heavily into that kind of like horror theatrics and it kind of came across as manufactured and kind of silly at this point. Glenn summed up what many people thought about this new iteration of the Misfits. He said, quote, the band you see now as the Misfits is not the Misfits. It's one guy trying to relive something and make some money because punk is fashionable again, end quote. But during a particularly disastrous show in 2000, two of the new members of the Misfits, including the vocalist, ended up just walking off of stage and quitting the band. Michael Graves, who was the new singer, said that he left because he never felt respected. He never felt like his opinion actually mattered in the band. Jerry was kind of a dictator and said that if Michael didn't like it, he could leave and Jerry could find someone better, which Michael very much doubted. In 2005, Doyle started his own project called Gorgeous Frankenstein and even started appearing with Glenn at a few shows and playing some old Misfits songs. In May of 2016, Jerry, Doyle, and Glenn announced that they would be reuniting and performing under the name The Original Misfits. 
The reunion actually came about as part of a court discussion on royalties. Apparently, reuniting was a part of a settlement. After they had played a few shows, Jerry was asked what the future for this new lineup of the Misfits was, and Jerry said, quote, I want it to continue. I know Doyle wants it to continue. I know Glenn wants it to continue. We just have to be big enough people to make it continue. And that's where we're at, whatever it takes, end quote. By 2019, Glenn was kind of hinting that this reunion was coming to a close. And that was around the same time that released court documents revealed that they had agreed to do 10 reunion shows as part of the settlement. But as of Halloween of 2022, they were still playing shows together. And that's the Misfits. Let me know what you thought about this band, about this video in the comments below. Are you a Misfits fan? What's your favorite song? Are you a fan of any other horror-themed metal punk rock bands? Also, if you liked the video, please give it a like. Consider subscribing if you want to hear more stories from music history. I try to release a few videos a month just kind of telling the story behind some popular bands and music genres.